welcome everyone to episode 75. Today, I'm going to take you on a journey exploring the immune system in animal organisms. This is going to be a really exciting and unique episode, because it's really different from a lot of the others. In previous episodes, I've talked about how animals interact with physical stuff. In episode 68, I talked about how animals use water, and how water is regulated within their bodies. In episode 70, I talked about how animals sense inputs from their environment, including a small range of detectable sound and light frequencies, and temperature, and even electromagnetic fields. And in episode 72, I talked about animal motion, and the physics of manipulating a body so that it moves through the world. In the most recent episode, I explored gas exchange, and physical gases like molecular oxygen and carbon dioxide that are breathed in and out by an animal. All of these topics are about animals interacting with non-living things, with physical matter in their environment. Only episode 69, Animal Nutrition, explored how animals interacted with other organic elements in their environment, like herbivores or carnivores that eat their respective prey organisms. Analogous to the third episode of the previous series, today's episode will also touch on a biological variable in the environment. In any discussion about the immune system, there has to be discussion of what the animal needs immunity from. In a very general sense, the animal needs to defend itself from pathogens, or harmful microbes or particles, in the environment. I've often described animals as being massive chemical superstructures, because I think that's a pretty accurate description, and it puts life in an interesting perspective. Animal cells, and all other cells really, are an ordered conglomeration of chemicals, interacting in regulated, genetically determined ways. In multicellular organisms, like animals, many dozens to trillions of cells compose a larger, massive being a superstructure, with some degree of awareness of the world around it that transcends the individual capacities of any single cell. From this angle, the animal body is an amazing orchestra of chemical reactions, moving elements and nutrients and ions throughout the body in these pulsing waves as food is digested and absorbed and energy is used. The chemical superstructure is defined by this perpetual outward flow of energy and chemicals, as nutrients are absorbed from the food tube at the core of the animal's body and distributed through the vasculature and across the cellular architecture of the entire body itself. On this cellular level, the driest, deadest, outermost layers of the animal superstructure are constantly flaking off, only to be replaced by new cells that are being pushed up from the basal membranes deeper in the tissue. The tissue I'm talking about here specifically is the skin, the outer barrier, or the outer surface of the animal's body. I'm being somewhat poetic, but I'm trying to give you a particular view of the animal's body, so that you might better understand what happens when a pathogen is able to interfere with and ruin it all. These pathogens are very tiny chemical superstructures, that enter the animal's body through wounds, or orifices, or body fluids. These pathogens can be small parasitic worms, like helminths and tapeworms, and they can be fungal spores that infect and grow out their mycelium within the animal's body. They can be bacteria, amoeba, and other single-celled microbes, and the list of pathogens also includes the barely counts as living molecular complexes called viruses. All of these pathogens, be they multicellular helminths, single-celled bacteria, or tiny viral particles, all of these can cause infections and disease, should they be able to somehow get past the animal's biochemical defenses. These defenses are known as the immune system, which works both passively and actively to keep pathogens out of the animal's body and to maintain its health. An animal has multiple defenses, including innate defenses and adaptive defenses. The innate immune system, uh, the innate defenses, they occur in all animals, even very simple animals, 
While the innate immune system has a rapid response to the pathogen, the innate immune system is also indiscriminate. It's a very generalized body response simply to the presence of a pathogen. It doesn't matter what pathogen it is. The innate defenses cannot detect specific pathogens and make specific responses, and it has no memory of previous infections. It's just a very general, uh, a very general response. The body's saying, oh, there's something in me that's bad. Let's just uh, swarm it with cytokines and heat and inflammation and some macrophages, and hopefully that'll take care of it. It's, it's just a very generalized emergency response. Now, when you talk about specificity and memory to a response, you're talking about the adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system is slower to respond to the pathogen, but it's more targeted. It's much more targeted, and it's more precise, and it retains a memory of previous infections, so that when a similar pathogen is encountered sometime in the future, the response to that pathogen is faster and stronger and even more targeted. This is why animals are much less likely to get infected by the same pathogen a second time. If you get the same disease two years in a row, that second year, that disease is probably a, a mutated strain or an altered version of the pathogen because that original disease that infected you last year, you developed an immunity to it. Your adaptive immune system has crafted uh, the, the necessary proteins and antibodies to respond to that antigen immediately. And so that particular strain is going to have a very hard time infecting you. But uh, if it mutated, if it changed or whatever uh, in the course of a year, then that makes sense that your body wouldn't necessarily recognize uh, next year's pathogen, and that would be able to infect you. So it's kind of this, this constant back and forth. It's like an evolutionary arms race on the scale of, uh, of your pathogens that infect you and the chemicals in your body that try and defend you. But I'll, I'll get into more of this protein selection and chemical evolution in a little bit later in the episode. Anyway, this adaptive immune response forms the basis of uh, the whole point of vaccinations. Vaccinations are like training for the immune system, and as a medicine, they've had such huge, profound benefits that it's literally changed the world. Alright, I keep getting somewhat distracted. Anyway, the innate and the adaptive immune systems operate to maintain the health of the animal. But as we all know, this isn't perfect. Disease is a terrible and prolific dealer of death, and despite the animal's best biochemical defenses, some pathogens are just too dangerous. They destabilize the animal's chemical superstructure, doing lethal damage, or creating problems that induce debilitating injury or susceptibility to secondary infections, which can all eventually lead to death. There is thus very strong evolutionary pressure on behalf of the animal to develop sufficient immunity to the microbes and microorganisms that saturate the world around it. There's no escaping them, so they must be dealt with on a physical and a chemical level. The first line of defense in virtually all animals, simple and complex, is innate immunity. And the first defensive structures of the innate immune system are the skin and the mucus. The skin, be it leathery mammalian skin, the scales of a fish or a reptile, or the porous skin of an amphibian, they all form a physical barrier between the animal's internal body, like its organs and nerves and gonads, and the outside environment. In many cases, the skin is waterproof. It's sealed, and it provides a complete barrier. Insects, in particular, will coat their bodies in a waxy cuticle layer, much like plants do to their leaves to make them waterproof. Except for insects, this waxy cuticle layer is quite effective at keeping out pathogens. Where the animal has a natural orifice, like a nostril, an eye, or a mouth, there is some kind of mucus or fluid secretion that lubricates and protects the soft, membranous tissues. For example, in the tissue fluid around a mammal's eye, there's an enzyme called lysozyme and it works as a general antibiotic to keep the eyes clear and healthy. The fluid, or mucus, will entrap pathogens and then make them easy targets for other protective enzymes and for immune cells, which I'll explore in a few minutes. Now, pathogens can overcome this innate defense with their own enzymes that allow them to burrow into the skin or disrupt the mucus lining of the nose and throat. Sometimes, pathogens will exploit an open wound to gain entry to the body, while others evolve to live around the animal's genitals so as to be spread to a new individual when the animal has sex. 
When the pathogen gets past the skin and penetrates into the animal's body, the chemical defenses of the innate immune system come into action. This is the beginning of the innate immune response, which, as I said, is a generalized response that doesn't develop a memory of pathogens. First and foremost in this generalized innate immune response, the white blood cells, or the leukocytes, will gather in the blood and meet at the point of infection. They will seek out and try to hunt down the pathogenic microbes and destroy them. They can differentiate between a bacteria, a fungus, and a worm, but they can't detect specific genera or specific species within those broad categories. The innate immune response is only able to determine the type of pathogen thanks to a class of molecules called pattern recognition receptors. Now, even though these can uh, determine the type of pathogen, it's important to understand that it's, it's still very coarse. Can't tell what species, it can only tell, oh, this is a bacteria, oh, this is a parasitic worm, but it doesn't know what kind, it doesn't know what particular family, genera, species, etc. So these pattern recognition receptors, they, they detect particular types of antigens produced by each type of pathogen. An antigen is any molecular residue that's given off by the pathogen, like maybe a bacterial secretion, or a tissue marker from a helminth, or maybe a fragment of a virus. These pattern recognition receptors are a broad class of receptor enzymes that detect a similarly broad range of antigens and they allow the animal to roughly identify the pathogen. Fungus, bacteria, helminth, etc. Humans, for example, have various receptors that can detect a specific type of antigen, like a signature a lipopolysaccharide on a gram-negative bacteria, or single strands of viral DNA, or a fungal molecule called zymosan. It's a decent little toolkit for all of your generalized immunity needs. Now, it should also be clarified that these pattern recognition receptors are also present in plants and fungus, which implies that they're a basal quality of virtually all eukaryotes. From an evolutionary perspective, the receptors that detect pathogen antigens are extremely important, and so they've been preserved across an explosively diverse branch of the tree of life for around half a billion years. All animals have these pattern recognition proteins expressed on the surfaces of their white blood cells. And when a particular receptor binds to its target antigen, it will initiate a specific response. This specific response typically involves the white blood cell secreting an enzyme or a molecule that will harm that specific kind of pathogen that was detected. For example, there's a type of molecule that's secreted by white blood cells called cytokines. Cytokine molecules are like signals to other immune cells, encouraging them to come en masse to the site of the infection and to respond in a particular way. This release of cytokines and other antipathogen chemicals will cause inflammation. Inflammation is the climax of the innate immune system's response to a pathogen. When a pathogen enters the animal's body, it will encounter a white blood cell called a macrophage. And upon detecting the pathogen, the macrophage will release chemokines, which are messenger molecules that recruit other immune cells to fight the pathogen. As these chemokines are released from the white blood cell immediately encountering the pathogen, they'll diffuse through the blood and they'll create a concentration gradient. And an immune cell following the increase in concentration of the chemokine will be led directly to the wound, or the site of the infection. Another part of the inflammation response involves mast cells releasing histamines, which are chemical signals that cause blood vessels to constrict so as to reduce blood flow towards the open wound, and thus reduce blood loss. This immediate response to pathogen entry signals the neutrophils, which are white blood cells that come racing to the site of the infection, to come and literally engulf and consume the pathogens. Once the neutrophils have consumed the pathogens through phagocytosis, the pathogens are chemically destroyed. They're digested on a cellular level. So as this process goes on, more and more immune cells will arrive, and they'll secrete cytokines that establish the full inflammation response, which is characterized by the heat and the swelling from the sheer accumulation and all this biochemical activity of all of these immune cells. This inflammation will be maintained until all of the pathogens can be cleared out, and there's no more antigen signals that are propagating this innate immune response. 
At this point, all that's left is the healing process, which began technically the moment the wound happened. So that's the innate immune response in a nutshell, and it exists in virtually all animals. However, for many animals, this is all that they have. This inflammation response and the associated cytokine and chemokine storm is the full extent of their immune capacity. Only vertebrates have evolved an adaptive immune system that can remember previous infections and make targeted defenses to rapidly destroy the pathogen should it come by in the future. The adaptive immune system can differentiate not only between fungus and bacteria and helminth, but it can also differentiate between genera and species and even subspecies. How does the adaptive immune system do this? Is there a limit to how many antigens it can detect and make a specific response to? The answer, apparently, is no. There is no conceivable limit. And this is because of the molecular nature of the antibodies themselves, which are the secret to the adaptive immune system's diversity and specificity of responses. Antibodies are proteins that get secreted by the immune cells, and they bind to specific parts of a specific antigen. The interesting detail is that the body doesn't have individual genes for every single possible antibody. They're more like custom-made proteins, shaped to fit the offending pathogen and its specific antigens. Now before I dive too deeply into antibodies, I want to briefly discuss the immune cells that secrete them. These are the lymphocytes, the white blood cells that live in the lymphoid system and perform the adaptive immune response. These lymphocytes are divided into the T cells and the B cells. The T cells are produced in bone marrow, but they migrate and then mature in the thymus and they seek out and destroy animal cells that are infected with viral particles. The B cells are produced in and mature within the bone marrow, and they get released from the bone marrow into the blood and into the lymphoid tissues so that they can actively move around and detect antigens and produce antibodies. This lymphoid tissue that the B cells move through includes the lymph nodes, the spleen, and the branching, lymph-filled vasculature of the lymphatic system that connects it all together. There's also the tissues within orifices that secrete mucus, and these are called MALT, uh, M-A-L-T, or mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. The MALT lines the points of entry to the body, like the respiratory tract, and the gut, and the nose, and this lymphoid tissue hosts populations of white blood cells that act as the first line of adaptive defenses. When these lymphocytes detect an antigen, they migrate to the spleen, or into a lymph node, where they become activated. So, to begin the adaptive immune response, an antigen has to be recognized. B cells have receptors for various antigens. These are called B cell receptors, or BCRs for short. These BCRs are composed of globular proteins called chains. There are light chains, and there are heavy chains, which are twice as long as the light chains. And all of these chains are all stapled together with disulfide bonds to build the B-cell receptor. A pair of proteins anchor the BCR into the cell membrane, and from these anchorage points extend two heavy chains, which bend outwards to form a Y shape. So they go up and then out like a Y. The light chains are attached to the lobes of the heavy chains, and these heavy chain lobes are the arms that form the Y shape. At the ends of each arm are the antigen binding sites. The combined heavy and light chain forms an arm, and the binding site is the hand at the end of that arm that grabs a specific antigen. The B cell can also secrete antibodies, which are basically these exact BCRs just detached from the anchor proteins keeping them bound to the membrane. So you have the membrane-bound uh, B cell receptors, and then when the B cell receptors break off of their little anchorage points, when they break off of the proteins keeping them bound to the membrane, they become just these free-floating proteins that can bind to antigens. And when they're in this state, when they're free-floating through the blood or the lymph, they're called antibodies. Antibodies. 
The T cells also have antigen receptors, and these are called T cell receptors, or TCRs. But these have a slightly different shape, and they work slightly differently. Where the Y-shaped BCR can just directly bind with and detect an antigen, the TCR is shaped like a capital I, with an alpha chain and a beta chain that just stand parallel to each other. And these have to have an antigen presented to it by another cell in a particular way in order for the T-cell to recognize it. This is a really, really important difference between T-cells and B-cells, because this, uh, this presenting of the antigen to the T-cell, where the T-cell then has to appropriately recognize it, this is a regulatory step. This regulates the T-cell response. So these antibodies, whether they're bound to the membrane of a B-cell or a T-cell, or whether they're detached and free-floating in the blood and the lymph, they're part of a class of molecules called immunoglobulin proteins, or IGs. Within this class of immunoglobulin proteins, there are subclasses with different functions. For example, there's the IgGs, which are just your typical secreted antibody. Or your IgDs, which are your typical cell-bound receptor. But there are also IgEs, which are antibodies that are secreted in small amounts to fight off parasitic worms. Then you have IgAs, which are pairs of antibodies, or antibody dimers, which are found mostly in the malt regions, and they keep bacteria from sticking to the cell membranes. And then you have IgMs, which are large groups of antibodies that float through the blood and the lymph and just sweep up as many antigens as they can find. When an antibody binds to an antigen, it binds to a specific region on the antigen called the epitope. The epitope is basically a point on the molecular structure of the antigen that antibodies can recognize and bind to. The antibodies are able to do this with the variable regions of their light and heavy chain proteins. Both the light and the heavy chains are themselves composed of two regions, called constant and variable regions. The constant regions are constant across pretty much all of the chains. They're like the unchanging base that attaches the light chain to the heavy chain. The magic happens in the variable region where the proteins are customized with unique amino acid sequences. It works this way. The animal has genes for several dozen protein variants for both its heavy chains and its light chains. All of these variants can be combined to potentially create 10 to the 10th to 10 to the 14th different kinds of BCRs, and virtually the same number of TCRs. Each one of these receptors would possess a slightly different molecular structure, and the different amounts and locations of reactive molecules would create a very specific chemical landscape, allowing bonds with only a very specific kind or shape of epitope. It's this extremely customizable quality of the variable regions that allows these antibody proteins to be shaped to fit onto at least one epitope on virtually every antigen. That's how the adaptive immune system is able to recognize such an amazingly wide range of pathogens. It has this extremely customizable variable region within the antibody structure. Now, all of this is just explaining how the lymphocytes recognize and bind to the antigen. What comes after this is called activation. If a lymphocyte matures, lives in the body for a while, and never detects the pathogen that it was programmed to detect, then it will eventually die, and its parts will be recycled. But when a pathogen is detected, those cells that are programmed to respond to that specific pathogen, those are sent on a war march to destroy it. The explanation for how the body generates and sends out the right lymphocytes with the right antibody programming is called the clonal selection theory. It works generally like this. When a lymphocyte is activated upon binding with an antigen, the lymphocyte will then divide and make copies of itself. Those clone lymphocytes that have a high affinity for the antigen will find it, bind to it, and make more copies. Those clones that have a poor affinity for the antigen will generally not find it. They'll be less likely to find it and bind to it and they'll die out. As time goes on, 
the activated lymphocytes will persist. They won't die off because they keep finding and binding to all, all of these antigens. They're very good at it. And so they'll endure long after the infection is over. They act like silent guardians, waiting and watching for any sign of their specific pathogen. This process of activation works differently in B cells as opposed to T cells, but in both cases, it's a highly regulated process. Unleashing these lymphocytes in the body can be dangerous because they're so powerful. So mechanisms have been evolved to control their release and control their activity and make sure that these, uh, these immune cells are shut down and go away when they should. At sites of infection, white blood cells called dendritic cells are consuming antigens. Inside of the bodies of these dendritic cells, the antigens are broken down into protein fragments, or the isolated epitopes, which are then given to a major histocompatibility protein, or an MHC. The purpose of the MHC proteins is to take the antigen fragments and present them properly on the surface of the dendritic cells, so that these can then in turn be presented to T cells. There are CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells, and there are class 1 and class 2 MHC proteins. As any immunology student will be able to tell you, a class 2 MHC will present its epitope to a CD4 T cell, and a class 1 MHC will present its epitope to a CD8 T cell. This is an unintuitive way to label things, but Hey, this is biology, where photosystem 2 comes first. Anyway, upon activation, the T cells divide to produce a bunch of clones. This happens through a process called clonal expansion, which primes the clones to differentiate for their specific role in the adaptive immune response. CD4 T cells become helper T cells, which go around and help activate other cells. They're helping because they spread the message, and they recruit more cells to the fight. The CD8 T cells become cytotoxic T cells, or killer T cells. These will target and destroy any of the animal's own cells that have become infected, in a scorched earth policy that denies the pathogen any living cells to feed off of or exploit. Now, in B cells, activation is a lot simpler. B cells can be activated by simply running into an antigen in the bloodstream. They don't need a dendritic cell to properly present it to them like a T cell. After activation, the B cells mount their newfound antigen onto a class 2 MHC protein, which allows them to be recognized by activated helper T cells. By binding to the class 2 MHC on the B cell, the helper T cells then help the B cells reach their full activation. And then the B cell creates clones, some of which will go on to turn into plasma cells. These plasma cells are almost ready to start fighting the infecting pathogen, but first they have to sharpen their weaponry. These plasma cells will go to a region of the lymph node called a germinal center where they undergo a process called somatic hypermutation. Here, the DNA that codes for the variable region of the antibodies will undergo a rapid series of controlled mutations, which then generates a wide diversity of antibodies. These antibodies have varying affinities for the antigen. Those that bind strongly to the antigen are preserved, and those that don't are left to die and decay and have their parts get recycled. When the plasma cells finish this process of somatic hypermutation, the surviving clone lineages have mutated a viable antibody that can strongly bind to the antigen. This is to say that the plasma cells have sharpened their swords and their spears, and they're now ready to go out and fight. They release these highly attuned antibodies, and these then flow to the site of the infection, where the adaptive response really begins. The adaptive immune response to a pathogen involves a lot of different mechanisms, but these can be organized into two broad groups, cell-mediated responses and humoral responses.
In the cell-mediated response, activated CD8 T-cells will engage in their cell-to-cell -cell scorched earth combat by finding the body cells that have been infected and killing them. The humoral response involves a more decentralized approach, where antibodies and other proteins involved in the immune response are secreted by a variety of cells into the blood and the lymph, where they float around like a giant cloud of particles. All of these antigens flowing to the site of infection will start binding to the pathogens that they encounter, and after a while, the pathogen particles will be coated in antibodies. This is a process called opsonization, or preparation for eating, because the pathogens that are opsonized, the pathogens that have been covered in antibodies, they're delicious targets for macrophages and for other phagocytes. These larger cells will swoop in, detect all of these antibodies, bind to them, and then consume the pathogen and chemically break it down into little molecular fragments. Opsonization is also really neat because the physical coating of antibodies prevents the pathogen from easily binding to stuff, which suppresses the pathogen's ability to infect new cells. So opsonization slows down the infection until all of the pathogens can be neutralized. Additionally, some antibodies have more than one binding site, and so these antibodies can bind to not just a pathogen, but to other antibodies as well. So multiple pathogens, all coated in antibodies, can find themselves all getting stuck together in a giant mass of neutralized, trapped pathogenic cells. This is called agglutination because the antibodies virtually glue all of the pathogen cells together in this, in this big accumulated mass. The pathogens can't infect host cells when they're all glued together in a big pile. This big agglutinated pile of pathogens is also really attractive to the macrophages and the neutrophils, because they see these agglutinated pathogens as like an all-you-can-eat breakfast buffet. As if all of this wasn't cool enough, there's also a group of proteins that are part of what's called the complement system. When there's a bunch of pathogenic cells all tied up and glued together with antibodies, these little complement proteins can come by and assemble themselves on the antibody-covered antigens. And then they literally puncture holes in the plasma membrane of the pathogen cells. Because these pathogenic cells are often neutralized or agglutinated, this puncturing attack is literally like shooting fish in a barrel. Imagine this from the pathogen's perspective. You know, you're a pathogen, and you are somehow able to get inside of an animal's body. And oh, before you know it, you're covered in all of these antibodies. They're sticking to your body and holding you down. Now you can't grab onto anything. You can't bind onto any cells and infect them because you're covered in all of these sticky antibodies. And then before you know it, other pathogens, other members of your ilk, they all are covered in antibodies too, and before you know it, you're all bumping into each other, and you're all stuck together. And now, all of you are, you're all panicking. You can't move anywhere. You can't infect any other cells. You're like, what are we going to do? We're, we're all going to get slaughtered in this animal's body. And as you're, as you're all bound together and tied up in these sticky antibodies, all of these complement proteins will come. And they'll attach all over your body. And you, as the pathogen, will be like, oh man, what's going on now? And then these complement proteins will just start blasting holes in your skin. They'll start blasting holes in your body so that your structural integrity falls apart and your body is super easy to break down and destroy. That's what happens to pathogens in the animal's body. That's how the adaptive immune response deals with invaders. It's pretty hardcore. Now all of these strategies, like opsonization and agglutination, they're all meant for destroying extracellular pathogens, like bacteria or small parasitic worms. When the pathogen is intracellular, like in the case of a virus, the infected cells will try to fight them off. Some, but not all, of the viral particles will get destroyed, and their fragments will be presented on the outside of the infected cell. The fragments get mounted in the class 1 MHC proteins on the outer surface of the cell, where they act like red flags that get recognized by other immune cells. This presentation of the fragments on the class 1 proteins is kind of like a warning, where the infected cell is saying, Look, I'm infected. 
here's some body parts of what's infecting me. You know, I, I'm dangerous. Stay away from me. Then, some activated CD8 T cells will anchor themselves to the infected cell, and they'll release a series of proteins. The first of these proteins will form some pores in the membrane of the infected cell. And this is kind of like a spec ops team blasting through the wall of a building to get inside. So when the pores are made, the CD8 T cells will then secrete an apoptosis activating protein. These proteins will flow through the pores into the infected cells. These apoptosis activating proteins will then cause the infected cell to commit apoptosis, to die, as if the spec ops team stormed the building and planted a bomb to deny it to the enemy. By destroying the infected cell, the intracellular pathogen is unable to replicate, and the infection is suppressed. Its ability to replicate and spread has been stalled. As I've talked about the innate and adaptive immune systems, I've compared them. For example, I talked about the speed of the reaction, where the innate immune system tends to be faster at first, uh, and the adaptive immune system is slower. But once the adaptive immune system has dialed in a particular pathogen, if that pathogen comes back, the adaptive immune response is extremely quick. I also talked about specificity. I talked about how the innate immune system isn't very specific. It can only recognize broad classes of pathogen, like parasitic worm or fungus or something. Where the adaptive immune system, in contrast, is extremely specific. The adaptive immune system has 10 to the 10th to 10 to the 14th different combinations of antibodies on the B cells, and the same number of antibodies uh, potentially on the T cells. So it's extremely specific. Now another quality that I mentioned is memory. The innate immune system has no memory, but the adaptive immune system does. The adaptive immune system remembers. It remembers which pathogens have dared to violate the sacred temple that is the animal's body, and it works to make sure that any future infections of that type, of that flavor, will be shut down quickly and mercilessly. To establish this immune memory, activated B cells and T cells will reproduce to create a specialized kind of daughter cell called a memory cell. These memory cells don't participate in the primary immune response, or the first time the adaptive immune system runs into a new pathogen. The memory cells don't fight in this battle. Instead, these memory cells accumulate in the spleen and in the lymphatic system, where they can live for years, if not decades. Within the spleen and the lymph nodes, these memory cells will reside and wait. If the same pathogen is detected again sometime in the future, these memory cells will detect the antigen as it's brought into the lymph system, and they'll initiate not a primary immune response, but a secondary immune response. This response is faster, it's more efficient, and it's more targeted. There's more antibodies, and they're razor-focused on their target, which is, at this point, a known invader. The secondary immune response is much more powerful than the primary response, and it can destroy an invading pathogen before the animal even realizes that it might be sick. That's how powerful it is. Another way to look at this is to consider the, uh, the plasma cells. The plasma cells have to have their weapons sharpened, so to speak. They have to go through that process of somatic hypermutation to produce antibodies that have an extremely high affinity for the antigen. And so, if they've already gone through this process of somatic hypermutation uh, upon the first infection, then during the secondary infection, they've already produced all of these extremely high affinity antibodies. And so these can just be pulled out of storage, like sharpened weapons being pulled out of an armory, and used right away. That also helps with the speed of the secondary immune response, the speed and the effectiveness of it. This is also the premise for how vaccines work. A vaccine is the injection of an inactivated or a dead pathogen, or a fragment of a pathogen. The immune system will take this inactivated pathogen, or this pathogenic fragment, and they'll create a primary response, which will then generate memory cells that will remember that pathogen for years. When the vaccinated animal meets a live version of the pathogen sometime in the future, it's already been primed for it, 
Uh, the plasma cells have already sharpened their weapons, and the secondary immune response will clear out the pathogen in no time. This is the power of the immune system. It is nothing less than an awesomely complex chemical defense grid that evolves in real time to fight off the dynamic pathogen load that the animal is exposed to. The animal is a chemical superstructure, a massive chemical orchestra of trillions of atoms, and the pathogens want to come in and wreck it all so that they can exploit those atoms and those chemical operas for their own purpose, to produce more pathogens and to spread. But the immune system puts a halt to all of that, protecting the macroscopic animal from the countless microscopic threats that it faces on a daily basis. This was an intense episode. I had a lot of fun writing it and doing the research, and I hope you found it just as exciting as I did. Next week, I'll be moving along in this second series on animal physiology to bring you the animal nervous system. So I'll be talking about the nerves and neurons, the synapses, the spinal cord, and the brain. If that sounds cool to you, if that sounds at all interesting, then be sure to come back next week and check it out. And as always, thanks for listening. Would you like to support the Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below. 